Hack Institute of Governance and Development. On behalf of CDS and BIGD, I welcome you all in this webinar on gender in the time of COVID-19. So before we start, uh, please note that uh, this meeting is recorded. So please switch off your cameras and also microphones muted. Uh, you can send your questions via chat and uh, the speakers will respond uh, uh, during the question and answer sessions. Uh, so this is a part of our ongoing webinar series um, uh, on different issues of COVID-19. Our next webinar will be uh, one week from now on South Asia. Today we have three speakers. Uh, these speakers are leaders in the field and they have spent decades studying deeply on many issues related to gender. Our uh, first speaker is Alaka Boshu. She is now a professor in the Department of Development Sociology at Cornell University. She was a senior fellow at the United Nations Foundation in Washington, D.C. and the director of the South Asia program at Cornell. She has served on the committees on reproductive health and population uh, and on the population projection of the uh, National Academy of Science and on expert committees of several UN panels. Now, our second speaker uh, will be Sajid Amin from Population Council in New York. Uh, she is currently leading the Population Council's work on livelihoods for adolescent girls and she has also served an advisory capacities to many international organizations including UNICEF, UNFPA, World Bank, Plan International. She has been a member of BRAC USA advisory board since 2007. Um, our last speaker is Toby Mansour. She is now currently at the School of Economics, University of Philippines and she is a member of the Philippines Human Development Network and uh, lead author and co-editor of the Philippines Human Development Report, and she has served uh, in many se senior positions in government. Finally, uh, we have a discussion, uh, Mahin Sultan, she is senior fellow at BIGD. Uh, she is now currently leading gender and social transformation cluster at Brock University. So, we all know that impacts of uh, COVID-19 are not gender neutral. This pandemic is ongoing. Uh, we are still assessing and trying to understand uh, the effects, uh, but the preliminary research and emerging data show that the girls and women are disproportionately affected, and they are more likely to share the burden of household work and suffer from domestic abuse. And this pandemic is affecting women's physical, mental, emotional health, and an increase in gender-based violence. Sexual and reproductive health services and resources for women demand more attention during this pandemic. Limited gains made in past decades towards gender equality are at risk of being rolled back. Therefore, we need to respond to the urgent need for evidence to inform effective policy formulation for girls and women in this crisis. So our speakers will shed light on these issues from their research and experience in the field. Uh, so with this, I would like now to request Alka to start her presentation. Oh, so just to say, I've tried to share, yeah. Oh, again, I'm not a share, sorry, share. Uh, yeah, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, uh, first of all, thank you very much for having this and for inviting me and that there's an audience that, given that we're all at such odd times, except for you people in Australia, I know people in the US should be in bed. And as I said, in India, two people like me should be in bed. But uh, so the, uh, what I'm doing is, since you've asked me to begin, uh, I'll just make a couple of general points. So what I've done is I've prepared a PowerPoint, which is 
the kind that I always tell my students not to prepare. Very densely packed. It's full of text instead of bullet points. May, largely because I'm not sure how well my voice will carry across, whether I might, uh, I, I don't know how to look at my notes and also the PowerPoint at the same time. So what I've done is pushed a lot of stuff in the PowerPoint, but you don't have to look at that. You can either listen to me or look at that. Uh, I know this is very bad practice, having a PowerPoint uh, which is uh, full of stuff. The second thing I want to say uh, before I get on to my topic is that there's still too little information. It's a pandemic that's had a huge cost, but these are costs that we aren't yet able to uh, quantify. And you can see the contradictions every second day, in the kinds of publications that are coming out or the reports in newspapers, etc. at every level, whether it's the medical information, the social impact, the economic impact. We keep uh, updating our position and keep often contradicting the position that we had the previous day. So this, uh, the data are scattered, they're not analyzed, they're not disseminated. So from that point of view, it's uh, what, everything that one says is somewhat speculative, including what I will say. Uh, the second thing I feel right now, again, looking at up to what we know right now, and at least from the point of view of India, that maybe while gender is important, gender is not central right now to the impact of the pandemic, at least in India. There are worse effects, it appears, or at least the most pressing effects seem to be on other kinds of social division, whether by class and poverty. You've all seen pictures of those migrants, those tragic pictures of those million, tens of thousands of migrants making their way home. Uh, and a lot of them are men, we have to acknowledge, because it's male workers who are trying to get back. But a lot of them are women and children as well. And that is, to me, right, the defining picture of the pandemic in India right now. There are things occurring at the, under the lens, things connected with gender, etc. But uh, right now, I think the first immediate focus has to be on the uh, special classes of the poor, uh, independent of gender. The other big issue is rising tensions between different groups, the religious groups, but other kinds of social groups as well. Then even on gender, the direct relationship uh, between the infection and uh, gender is not yet very clear. Certainly the death rate is higher for men, whether that is because uh, of biological reasons connected with some immune response differences or for behavioral reasons connected with the bad lifestyles that men are more likely to have and therefore higher comorbidities, or demographic reasons, maybe the men who are getting infected are younger than the women who are getting infected. I don't know, it's probably a combination of all these things, but the direct relationship, at least not in terms of infections, because infection levels are difficult to gauge with testing being so haphazard, but at least in terms of death rates, uh, it's not very clear that women are directly more affected than men. Uh, what I think gender is doing uh, is important is that existing disparities by gender are definitely getting exacerbated by this pandemic. Uh, and one specific form of gender impact, which is the one I look at right now, is the impact on sexual and reproductive health and rights. So that's the one I'm going to focus on, and that's what I'm going to talk about. And as I said, we don't have enough data, so I don't, uh, I can't really. Uh, give you an empirical analysis of what's going on. A lot of it is speculative, but what I can do and what I'm trying to do is at least create some frameworks of analysis, which we can then try to push data into and see whether those frameworks make any sense. Now, there are several kinds of frameworks we can have, conceptual frameworks, and I'm thinking of three in particular. One of them would look separately at the different components of what we mean by sexual and reproductive health and rights, and how the pandemic has an impact or a relationship with different components of, of SRHR. The second kind of framework that we can look at is look at it from the point of view of the pandemic, the virus. What are the different kinds of impact that the pandemic itself has on SRHR? And the third is, of course, the sources of the impact, which I may not go into now. But what I meant was that the impact can come from the virus itself. The impact can come from state uh, response to the virus, the impact can come from societal factors that uh, take center stage, the impact can come from other institutions like religion or the family. The family is a very important source of the impact. I may not go into that now, but I'll talk about the first two. So uh, is this speed okay? You can hear me?
Okay. So the first thing is really the component, the first kind of framework. One can think about sexual and reproductive health and rights as being composed of sexual and reproductive health and sexual and reproductive rights. They're not the same thing. They're both important. They play into one another. But the way I think about the difference between them is sexual and reproductive health is a relatively uncontested arena, except for very specific parts of it, say abortion. So the health part of it is something that we'll all agree that everyone deserves good sexual and reproductive health. But when we come to the question of sexual and reproductive rights, that's a much more contested area all over the world. And again, not just in terms of abortion, but in terms of a range of sexual and reproductive uh, behaviors and, uh, and uh, autonomies that people want. So the, and there, I think the pandemic can be having an, uh, an indirect effect that uh, we, uh, is very difficult to catch, but that we should be uh, cautiously watching out for. So what do I mean by sexual and reproductive health, the less contested part? It, it includes a whole range of things, but in particular, these are the things that are included. Uh, if we are going to think especially in the context of the current uh, pandemic, contraceptive access and use, access to safe and affordable abortion, safe pregnancy delivery and post-delivery related health care, prevention and treatment of uh, reproductive tract illnesses, sexually transmitted infections, reproductive tract cancers, and prevention and care of gender-based violence. So COVID-19 has, has real and potential impacts on each of these categories uh, that make up what we call sexual and reproductive health. Uh, sexual and uh, reproductive rights is something bigger and narrow in some sense, but it really refer, it refers to the universal right to the highest standard of sexual and reproductive health that everyone should have access to. And more importantly, and more contested, the right to make one's own decisions about sexual and reproductive uh, uh, behavior without fear, discrimination, or coercion, and with positive support, not just an acknowledgement, but with positive support for the expression of these rights to make one's own decisions about sexual and reproductive behavior. And COVID-19, again, has real and potential effects on each of these, which I'll talk about very briefly. So coming to uh, the second uh, part of it, which is the different kinds of impact, one can think about the impact coming from in different ways. One can think about an impact which is direct and deliberate, that we want to do certain things to contain the pandemic. And, and that's going to have an impact, uh, and uh, which means that we will take acts which have an impact on SRHR. The second one is direct and unintentional. That's many of our direct actions are not directed at sexual and reproductive health and rights, but they end up exerting collateral damage. And the third one actually is the most devious, which is indirect and intentional. That it's indirect uh, things that we are doing at this point of time, with the intent, in fact, of affecting sexual and reproductive health, often in a negative direction. So I'll talk about the three of them separately. What do I mean by the direct and deliberate impact of COVID? The deliberate and, and, uh, and direct impact of the pandemic uh, occurs in two ways, uh, on SRHR occurs in two ways. One is because so many resources are now being diverted to COVID-19 which means there's less available for other things, including sexual and reproductive rights, uh, health in particular. So many sexual and reproductive health services, example for pregnancy, delivery, and abortion, although many countries, India included, have called them essential, they are not easily available because the resources have been diverted. Hospitals that could provide them have no, are not able to provide them. Uh, they, because they're, they're, they've been taken up with COVID activities, private clinics have been taken up. So there's all kinds of diversion. The, the spot of uh, resources available for SRH has often been taken away for COVID-related activities, partly correctly so, because right now this is an urgency. But it does mean that even when you pay lip service to the idea that SRH is an essential service, and that required special action by NGOs to get countries to really... Uh, uh, action by NGOs and the WHO to get countries to declare SRH as an essential activity. It still means that they might be essential, but they're not easily available. Well, in many places, people are being turned away. We have reports every day in the Indian newspapers of women not being able to access uh, antenatal care, good delivery care, 
abortion in particular. But also, uh, uh, then there's another deliberate one, which, which is access to contraception. Here, in fact, they've not, contraception has not been declared essential, and the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, for example, has suspended services for sterilizations and IUDs in public facilities right now. So women who want uh, these uh, contraceptive services actually cannot get them in the public health care system. So there's already one cost that is taking place. The ones that it can officially get, it often cannot in actual practice get. Women cannot get. So that's the direct reason. One of them is the diversion of resources. And the second one is that even when services are available, women are uh, avoiding these services because of fear of exposure to the virus. So you have SRH services, even when they are there in principle, partly they're not there in practice. Partly, they're not being taken up by in practice. Taken up in practice. Again, I don't know what the right position is because we know too little of the risks of the virus to pregnant women, to the fetus, to different stages of pregnancy, the risks of mother-to-child transmission. All these things in the context of HIV/AIDS, for example, took us a lot of time to understand. And it's too early in this pandemic, and so people are uh, rightly a bit nervous. They're also nervous because of the excessive fear that has been built around this virus. May, uh, I, I may be in a minority, but I do feel that all over the world, the fact that 97% of people recover on their own from this virus is being completely overshadowed by the stigma and the fear attached to it. It was done, I think, initially to get people to follow the rules, whether it is wearing masks or social distancing, etc. But now it has gone so far that people are terrified. So you have people committing suicide, when they think that they're positive. In India, we've had several cases of people jumping off hospital balconies because they've been tested positive. You have people using corona as a form of abuse. So uh, Muslims in India, if you now today, if you want to abuse, abuse them, you, you call them corona carriers. Uh, you, then it's being used as a form of stigma. You don't let health workers who are positive, and this is not just India, it's happening all over the world. But because of this excessive stigma and fear associated with it, people are not accessing even the SRH services that are available, and we do have many examples of that. The, but the second set of effects is direct and unintentional which is to do with that that wasn't the part of the act, but the, these, the policies that have been enacted for COVID uh, had having an impact on sexual and reproductive health in various ways. For example, the lockdown effects have affected the supply uh, and the supply chains of uh, contraception, uh, drugs for treatment of RTIs and STIs, uh, they were, uh, and they were affected not just the, uh, the supply, but also the access to the supply, because there's no public transportation, so how do women access antenatal care? How do they go to the hospital for a delivery? Again, we have lots of horror stories about women not being able to get a pass to take a woman in labor to the hospital. So access to abortion, of course, is an even deeper problem, but even the normal antenatal care deliveries and contraception and drugs for treatment. The second thing that's happened indirect is, of course, the increased poverty that everyone's talking about, which means that many of the services, if they're not provided by the state, have become unaffordable. Whether it's antenatal care, whether it's contraception, whether it's infant care, they have become much more difficult, and they then go down on the list of things that the family will spend money on. Uh, you can see it in the uh, Mari Stopes clinics in India have a closed down right now, at least temporarily. And that's the biggest supplier of family planning services outside the public health system. And the public health system, as I told you, has already decided not to provide services for sterilizations and IUDs. So there's a huge potential impact, therefore, on all aspects of SRH, which are negative unintended pregnancies, unplanned births, unsafe abortions, maternal mortality, stillbirths, neonatal mortality, all these things that go under the uncontested area of uh, uh, sexual and reproductive health. And uh, if you look, uh, there are some figures, I won't spend time on them, but there are figures, for example, from the Guttmacher Institute that has estimated for the developing world as a whole that even a 10% decline in services for contraceptive use, antenatal care, and delivery can end up in these countries with an additional 49 million women over the course of the year with an unmet need for contraception, uh, uh, 28,000 maternal deaths, 168,000 neonatal deaux, and so the 3.3 uh, million unsafe abortions, 
so this is a huge cost. In India, we have a, some similar calculations that have been made, which say that if the current level of constraints and services continues until the, uh, September, we will end up with an additional 2.4 million unintended pregnancies, 680,000 unplanned births, 834,000 unsafe abortions, and 1,700 maternal deaths. If this constraint continues beyond September, the numbers will rise much higher. So obviously the impact of the direct and indirect impact on uh, the reproductive health part of it is going to be very large. And this is something that we, needs to be kept in mind, even though I say that there are other things like the migrant problem that also needs to get set to stage. So and the, the other important thing, as I said, is that we are also going to get all these problems exacerbating inequalities within women. I don't want to look at it as just men versus women, but all these effects will be felt disproportionately among the disadvantaged women, whether it's the poor, the lower caste, religious minorities, sexual minorities. So it's going to exacerbate uh, gender inequalities, but also within gender inequalities, which are being heightened by larger global processes like the global drag rule, the Trumpian version of it, which is even more stringent than the original Mexico policy. And so uh, we really need international action uh, to address some of these issues. It's not just a question of what countries can do. I think um, the US, for example, has a major role to play. Then there is the third category, the one that I talked about, is the indirect and intentional impact of the pandemic. And I really think that this is something that we need to think about. And it's particularly important in the context of contested components of SRHR, which is to do with rights, sexual and reproductive rights, not just sexual and reproductive health. And this is a, a good time for the state. We are seeing this in other areas, not just in the context of SRHR. So we are seeing this in the context of all kinds of other policies. This seems to be a good time for the state to be taking all kinds of action and to be getting away with many acts of commission or omission that would be more intensely scrutinized or resisted in more normal times. So things are being done uh, under the radar because everyone's busy thinking about the pandemic. Things are being done which will be difficult to undo uh, unless we prevent them from being done right now. And this, the context of SRHR uh, is happening in many ways. It's happening somewhat differently in India than it might happen in other parts of the world. And there are examples of policies and behaviors that could get worse under cover of this COVID pandemic uh, being the overwhelming focus of attention. For example, there's a population control law sitting in parliament, which was introduced by a member. And I'm very worried that the law might actually get passed past in, uh, at this time when people are focused on other things. They, and it might be associated with laws that uh, do not criminalize sufficiently, for example, forced abortions, forced sterilizations, maybe even forced hysterectomies. I don't know how many of you know some of these things that have been going on about, for instance, the, I mentioned hysterectomies because there was this uh, terrible study, uh, a discovery that in parts of Maharashtra, agricultural female workers were being uh, st uh, having forced hysterectomies so that they wouldn't suffer the discomforts of menstruation and have to miss work because of that. So there are all these things that are, are going on under the radar which will get ignored uh, because we are all focused on the pandemic and which will get ignored to the extent of becoming sufficiently institutionalized legally or informally and then end up really being uh, becoming normal in some sense once the pandemic is over and the fight to undo many of these things is going to be very difficult. And so this indirect and intentional impact, I think is something we all need to be looking out for globally and differently in India. For instance, the West is more concerned about the in intentional impact of abortions being stopped, the abortion being declared not. Uh, so the pro-abortion lobby in the US, for example, is completely caught up in, the, in this idea that uh, the state is using, different states are using the pandemic to make abortion access uh, more difficult, uh, deliberately difficult uh, for, uh, for women at this time. In India, I think it's going to be the opposite issue that we need to worry about, that abortion might become not more difficult, but in fact may become uh, more coercive. 
domestic violence, we can already see this happening all over the world with shelter in place uh, policies. This is again something that unless uh, strong action is taken against, uh, uh, it's not, uh, if you continue with the attitude of men will be men and boys will be boys, this is something again that uh, I fear is not going to get onto the national radar right now. So there are all these uh, indirect impacts on the contested parts of SRHR which need to be kept in mind. Let's uh, try to look for some light and I'm wondering whether there might be a few good outcomes of SRHR in India, for instance, or other parts, we'll have to wait and see, we don't have data. For example, it'll be interesting to see if this period results, results in a drop in sex selective abortions and a rise in the masculinity ratio in the country, because that has been getting worse in many parts of the country, but with abortions now becoming difficult, maybe sex selective abortions will also become difficult and people will get used to the idea of maybe having daughters is not so bad after all. There might be a drop in unnecessary C-sections there might be a drop in forced abortions or sterilizations. And some of this might happen just because at least in the short run, there's less bandwidth available through the, because of the pandemic for the state to introduce it to people's, uh, to intrude into people's reproductive and sexual lives. I don't know. We'll see by next year whether we act. We are not even finding data on even last year's birth and death rates. So I don't see when, how long it'll take us to know what's happening to birth and death rates and sex ratios. But maybe a year from now, we will discover a few things that actually worked in a good direction. So finally, policy initiatives. Again, I think the policy initiatives, some of them have to be very practical, but others have to be ideological. That is, and the practical ones are some of them are immediate, but the ideological ones really is that we need to use the space to uh, expand the discourse on SRHR for the longer term. So what do I mean by practical short term? In these would have to include much more actively thinking about supply chains and services for contraception, abortion, and delivery, so that the, what we call essential actually becomes available. Things like isolation wards for delivery, a greater focus on the disadvantaged groups. As I said, we are going to get a much uh, worsening of disadvantages within women. So women in the care economy, pay, whether it's paid or unpaid, sex workers, uh, sex workers are going through a very rough time, it appears, both in terms of exposure to risk as, as well as in terms of loss of income. And so, but again, this is a category that gets left out. Uh, an important one that I think is uh, offering more services over the counter, contraception, abortion, whatever it is, as well as services in the home maybe increase the facilities for home births. I've never understood why institutional deliveries is being is treated in the SDGs as an indicator of maternal care. There's no real great evidence that institutional deliveries actually, given the state of our institutions, uh, bring down maternal mortality or neonatal mortality. So maybe this is a time during the pandemic to step up, uh, uh, to step up uh, investments in non-emergency, uh, non-institutional deliveries. These are some of the kinds of practical short-term uh, issues that we can think about, talk about. And the long-term ideological one is important, I think. This is an opportunity now for us to assess, uh, reassess our attitudes to SRHR. We have evidence from other places like the Zika outbreak really made the Latin American countries think more seriously about the connection between religion and abortion. And many countries did realize that the Zika was an entry point in some sense to think about women's right to abortion and not to let the church dictate that uh, uh, whatever the risks to the fetus and the mother with an infection of Zika, uh, that you would need not, uh, uh, abortion was absolutely off the cards. We, this is the time to frame better laws on surrogacy, on assisted reproductive technologies, et cetera, that are compassionate and globally coordinated. You must be reading about things that is happening to surrogacy, for example, uh, babies that are being born but cannot be picked up by parents because of lockdowns and transportation problems. Uh, ARTs, women are being forced to stop fertility treatments in the middle of their cycles. All kinds of things going on, not just in the rich countries, but in the poor countries as well, and we need much more uh, coordination. We need, this is a good time to think harder about what we mean by reproductive freedom, the if, when, and how, women's right, reproductive freedom, the right to have 
if to have, whether to have children, when to have them, how to have them, and the freedom. The West talks only about the freedom not to have it because they're obsessed with the abortion question. But there's also the freedoms in India about when to have children, how many to have, with whom to have them. These are things that maybe this is a good time to now use some of the space we have to think about it. This is also the time to retreat to talk long term from all coercive plans like population control laws, this love jihad nonsense that had taken center stage in India, forced abortions and sterilizations, whether by the state or society or by private operators, reverse the global gag, uh, gag rule, and much more attention to gender-based violence because uh, it's showing us what happens when families spend too much time together. However loving families are, I know from every, the experience around me, from people I know myself, that after some time we can all get on one another's nerves. If families are not as loving, the scope for domestic and other, other kind of forms of violence, which it appears there's is rising everywhere, is very, uh, very big. And this is something which should feed into our longer term analysis of gender-based violence prevention and care. And finally, what I started off with, is we need to keep our data collection, analysis, and dissemination active and ongoing. My presentation has been full of speculation, but I'm hoping that we will find innovative, but also non-innovative, but mechanical ways, uh, data availability, to be able to speak next time we have a meeting like this, to be able to speak much more confidently about what the relationship is between the pandemic and SRHR. Thank you. Thank you, Alka. Um, we will move uh, quickly to Sajeda because we are running out of time. Okay, can everyone here see my screen? Yeah. Okay, thank you, uh, Asad. Thank you, Alka, for that expansive um, treatment. Um, I'm going to go to the minutia and talk uh, about um, some data collection efforts that we had to take up um, uh, as part of programs that we were doing um, and hopefully uh, to move a little bit the needle a little bit in the direction of what might be happening. So um, we've been, and this is mostly data from Bangladesh. This is mainly um, addressing um, how women and girls have experienced the pandemic and associated lockdown. So um, just to set the context, um, the just some dates. Um, we, um, the first COVID case in Bangladesh was reported in March 8th. March 18th, there were school closures uh, nationally and um, then a national holiday was announced. So not a lockdown, but a holiday that looked very much like a lockdown with a complete ban on passenger travel via water rail and domestic air. Uh, so it was in this context, um, we did a, a phone surveys in the latter half of April. So two weeks into, um, two or three weeks into the lockdown. Um, so this graph shows the number of cases, which are test positive cases are in the uh, neighborhood of 3,500. Um, the number of deaths is about three, or right around 350. Uh, so it's a time when the pandemic is just flowing out, just revealing. Let me see a little bit about the surveys that we, that I'm going to talk about that have been directly and indirectly in involved with. So they're both surveys done in the context of implementing service delivery programs and a skills development program for rural adolescent girls in five districts um, and uh, a program among the urban homeless, mostly adult women, done by Sajida Foundation uh, under their Amrao Manush program. Amrao Manush means we are people too. Um, late April, like I said, so the girls' uh, survey is um, about 1,959 uh, respondents, and we were successful in completing interviews with 68%, and for Amram Manush, it was 572, about 70% reached. The surveys by, were done either by program staff or interviewers who had already been in contact with the respondents, and that's actually an important part of uh, 
uh, what I'm about to say about the surveys themselves. Um, we uh, tried to follow ethical protocol, took consent by SMS in the adolescent surveys, and we kept them short, um, 22 minutes. So just for reference, our typical adolescent surveys in these same populations, we just completed one in February, is around 45 minutes. So it's about half of the length. Um, and the idea is to do a series of rapid surveys to try and understand how lives are affected as the epidemic unfolds and to add on new questions, new issues that may emerge and that are important to address. Um, I keep doing this, don't I? Uh, so the structure of my presentation is that I'm going to first talk about certain methodological issues and particularly uh, reflections on the rapid phone survey, which I already have done, um, which um, to me, my general impression is sort of I'm much, I'm much more pleased. This is much less expensive than what uh, normally we would um, spend on surveys of this scale. Um, and um, it's, um, it also kind of represents a reality of young people that we don't uh, normally um, assume. So for instance, in Bangladesh, um, both among this extreme vulnerable group in the urban areas and uh, among young adolescent girls who are also kind of the most invisible group in the uh, population, around 98% owned a phone and uh, in the household. And like I said, the response rate was around 70. So I think for an in-person survey, uh, it would of course be over 90%, we assume, but at a much greater cost. And um, the, this survey, you know, we're concerned that these are representative of less vulnerable, more advantaged people, and therefore somehow is not as believable. Um, I think um, we need to judge that um, in, in, in comparison to who we miss when we do in-person surveys. But anyway, my, my general reflection on methodological issues is that I was having been trained in a very traditional demographic um, sense of um, doing um, in-person surveys, I'm pleasantly surprised at how, um, both how easy it was and how um, it might, it opens up a whole new world and maybe a new normal in terms of how we do business in this field. Uh, second, I'm going to talk about uh, certain indicators uh, of knowledge practice uh, about uh, with regard to COVID-19. At the early stages of the uh, pandemic, um, in a situation when people are being bombarded by informa information, and I've found personally this the evidence here to be very um, interesting both because in some sense we were de developing these surveys and asking these questions and analyzing them at the same time as Alka was saying, as we were sort of getting new information and revising what we thought about the disease, about the illness, about what is right to do and whatnot. And I'm going to talk in that uh, context about uh, sort of the main um, implement that we have to combat this um, disease, which is social distancing and the constraints around that. And then finally, I'll talk about the impact of the lockdown. And as Alka has said, sort of it's very difficult at this stage in, in Bangladesh, where I don't think the, the imposition of the lockdown was anywhere as uh, intense as, as uh, it, Alka describes it for India, but it nevertheless had pretty uh, strong impacts. Um, and I'll touch upon some indicators about violence and what people's perceptions are about uh, the situation. So these graphs are basically to say that uh, we were interviewing, interviewing adolescent girls, the majority of whom were 13 to 14 year olds in seventh and eighth grade, and generally uh, amazed at the high levels of knowledge, the ability in questions where we allowed them to spontaneously identify symptoms of COVID. For instance, they identified the usual series of um, uh, dry cough, fever, um, runny nose, 
some of which are flu symptoms, some, some of which are COVID specific. Uh, and, you know, the purpose of these questions was to say, you know, how can you improve your communication? And there's not that much in terms of sort of providing more information. Perhaps the, 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 the data is telling us that uh, there needs to be a clearer differentiation of what symptoms are COVID specific as opposed to particular to the flu and at what stage are they important. Uh, but in general, it seems like they, these respondents are um, no better or worse off or no worse off than my 14 year old daughter uh, who has the advantage of uh, a very different kind of information base. Um, similarly, on the question of how does the coronavirus spread, um, very high percentages or nearly 80% uh, identified the contagion in terms of from an infected person. And there are a couple of issues in which they didn't seem to be very aware. So for instance, there was the, only a third of the respondents in the adolescent survey uh, were able to identify, say, agreed that there could be asymptomatic spread. And um, similar proportions uh, agreed that uh, they could be spread through touching contaminated surfaces. So there's again, sort of a little bit of room about more differentiated, more um, uh, richer information um, can be provided. <clears throat> uh, so this basically identifies all of the ways in which girls know what is at stake and what the modes of contagion are and what the right response is. Uh, they're aware of the need for self-isolation. Um, a third of the girls stated that they, one of their responses if they were infected was to, that they would call a helpline or a telemedicine line. So that was pretty impressive. Um, but then when you talked about why they didn't, why, why they couldn't practice these things or what they would think were the barriers to practice, uh, it was sort of very structural around, you know, not being able to wash their hands in the same way. There's been a big conversation in Bangladesh about um, the absence of running water and all of the information being uh, about washing your hands properly with a constant stream of running water. So um, kind of the need to adapt to those realities. Similarly, in most places, even in urban areas, when there is a nearby hospital, the, it, it's very well known that most people have extremely inadequate access and that's become a lot worse in this situation of um, stigma and uh, associated with COVID and uh, contagion related to COVID. Um, and uh, finally, there was a lot of discussion in these surveys um, as well as with the care providers about the limits to how well people can isolate um, self, uh, either self-isolate or uh, stay away from um, an infected person. Uh, so all of this, we, we tried to assess with a question about how likely uh, young people thought they were, uh, they could be infected and a very high proportion said they were not likely. And this is again at a time when there was a lot of information about the higher risk of older people to COVID. And I think that's what's being reflected in this. What's interesting is that there was this age gradient, younger people thought they were less likely than older people, but married girls, young married girls perceived higher risk. I don't think that uh, was ever told uh, to them, but that's how they perceived. Um, and overall about 10% said, gave some kind of an up to, uh, up to God um, response to uh, questions about, you know, how likely they were. Uh, and that percentage, by the way, is very similar to a survey that was done in India and in Kenya about um, sort of fatalistic responses to this. Um, <clears throat> both the surveys that we looked at um, had very, as you would expect, and I won't dwell on this too much, very high proportions reporting that they uh, were um, uh, not, um, that incomes had reduced drastically, sort of 80 to 90 percent, uh, either <clears throat> had no income or had much more, re much, very reduced income. And um, the, the same pr proportion basically identified uh, shortage of food and staples as their major need um, during this pandemic. So early stages of the pandemic, these are the uh, concerns. 
So turning very quickly to uh, mental health during the pandemic, um, uh, we asked this question for adolescent girls and we, to women, uh, vast majority, nearly 75% said they were either depressed often or um, sometimes um, during this lockdown. And a lot of this in, in, the, in, in the instance of adolescents had to do with the, the fact that schools were shut down, they had no place to go. Seventh and eighth grade, this is the majority of these girls, um, is when there's the highest rate of school dropout. And a lot of the concerns about not going to school uh, would mean not taking the exam, therefore um, being married off um, in the near future. Uh, and in the program that we were offering, because the, there's a very strong social uh, support component that was that came out uh, very clearly in the interviews. Um, and of course, as one would expect, very high rates of uh, domestic violence, much higher violence reported by unmarried as well as married girls, higher rates of violence for older girls. Um, and that's reflected in their own experience of increased violence during the um, epidemic as well as uh, observing violence around them. Uh, and finally, in the urban survey, uh, there was an interesting question about what are you worried about? Over 90% um, described um, getting um, food and starvation being their major concern, unemployment being, being a, a very high concern right up there, but also getting sick. Uh, so that's not beyond their uh, imagination as to uh, what they're concerned about. Um, uh, and there was some interesting reflection from the people running the program about um, what, um, how people were perceiving this um, shock to their system, the shock to their lives. Um, so for the urban swell, slum dwellers who are, um, uh, the, their concern was, you know, they were doing better, they were kind of finding their feet and this, there would be a backsliding. Um, a lot of the worry about COVID was around, you know, if this could happen in the U.S. and Italy, God knows how bad it will be for uh, Bangladesh. Um, and uh, of course, sort of the, the condition of slums and uh, pavement dwellers and the dense populations uh, is again part of the infodemic of what are the factors that lead to contagion. And that's also a, a major part of the worry. Um, and uh, just one question that was asked in the urban survey that was interesting, uh, this is in the context of providing cash subsidies <coughs> to urban poor. They were asked about whether they had access to mobile bank banking and about 60% that said they had access. In Bangladesh, this whole mobile banking or ID cards are, are um, still not widespread. Uh, but what was interesting, um, and there was inter there was some differences in, in, in terms of living conditions. Uh, the more vulnerable obviously less, had less access. But what was interesting is some of the staff then said that um, because the survey indicated that there might be the prospect of getting subventions, the respondents called back saying, "Oh, you know, I told you I didn't have an account, but now I do. I was managed to go and uh, get one." Um, and I I think that sort of indicates sort of an overall um, sense that we have that people are uh, both sort of very aware of what's happening and then um, kind of responsive to what they might do to correct their situation. So to summarize, um, uh, I wanted to convey that our survey experience, um, uh, we were very pleased with the way we reached the most vulnerable and hidden populations at the high success rates um, and in the way we were able to implement rapidly um, these relationships. And, but the important point is to say that these surveys were conducted by, um, by people uh, who could build on existing relationships. And that's probably an important consideration going forward in terms of doing these faceless surveys. Um, uh, on the infodemic, there's widespread exposure to information, understandable confusion, but really kind of no different from any other place where people are trying to rapidly learn about a changing situation. Mm. And uh, very clear that access to services and infrastructure are important constraints. Um, 
as well as sort of the real constraints around social distancing. Um, income and food security it sort of resonates what's found everywhere else. There's, um, I think, the story about violence and mental health, like the story about SRHR, will unfold, we hope, when we go back and we kind of find out more about how things are. And in particular, we expect that for the adolescent population, as well as for the vulnerable poor, Mm, issues of violence and issues of mental stress are going to emerge as really important uh, issues that might um, be the one that puts people over the edge. I'll stop there. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Sajida. Uh, we'll come back to you both. Um, uh, just to inform you on behalf of CDS, we are also running a number of surveys in India and Bangladesh on this and related issues. We'll be actually giving our results very soon. Uh, so that's in, and from what you have done, uh, we, we also observed that um, the phone survey response rate is around 70%, which is good uh, and encouraging. Uh, we will be giving more details in the near future. Uh, now we uh, let's move to Toby. Hi, uh, good afternoon. Let me just um, share my screen. Um, is it okay if I just flash the, the photo? Yeah. Okay. Uh, hold on. Okay. Um, good afternoon. I'm Toby Monsard. Um, I, I feel a little insecure because this presentation doesn't have any empirical uh, data. It's just um, some reflection on uh, COVID and gender. Uh, but, so my plan is to give you context on the Philippines and uh, gender pre-COVID, and then talk about um, COVID and its disruptions and challenges to, uh, to gender. So um, the last nine years have been pretty good for the Philippine economy. Um, uh, it grew year on year about 4.5% um, per capita, real per capita, up from about 0.5 in the 90s. That growth has also been um, more inclusive. Extreme poverty was halved um, between 91 and 2015, and income poverty um, also has also dropped. And in the last three years, about 6 million people um, were lif lifted out of poverty. Um, those years, the the, the these years have also been very good for women's rights. Many laws have been enacted since 1995, including the Magna Carta of, of Women, um, which is a landmark law for us, which serves as the national translation of the SIDAO, and which strengthens um, our Philippine Commission on Women. I think we were one of the first countries that had a commission um, dedicated to uh, gender and development. Um, importantly, we have now a responsible parenthood and uh, reproductive health law, which took 20 years to get. Um, we're a Catholic country uh, that explains it. Um, a, num a number of laws have also been passed to protect um, the rights of children, especially the girl child. So we're talking about um, laws about trafficking, uh, pornography, and so forth. And um, we've also had, there's, there's also been uh, significant gains in the areas of organizing at the community level, which is really a, a very important part of um, the gender movement. That said, um, neither human development uh, nor women's empowerment have uh, advanced at a satisfactory pace. That is, incomes have not been converted into outcomes as expected and laws and programs for women haven't quite delivered um, tangible improvements to their status. So um, the next slide we have, I'm showing you a comparison of outcomes, which is the left slide, the left uh, diagram and in incomes, which is on your right. So the left is the human development index. It shows how it has moved over the years. It's kind of flat. Um, you can see how other uh, countries uh, around us have overtaken uh, the Philippines. And it was at its lowest, even while uh, GDP per capita was moving at its fastest. 
So um, it just tells you that more is, it, it, it's, it's not just about income, obviously. Um, in fact, the country's rank, um, HDI rank, has been lower than its GNI rank since uh, 2014, which means that um, our resources have been allocated. We interpret that as our resources being allocated away from human development um, relative to uh, the previous 23 years. Um, here I'm just showing you the different components of the Human Development Index, and you can see how which ones are, are flat and which explains um, perhaps why H, the HDI is kind of flat. So the life expectancy at birth, expected years of schooling, um, and so forth. Okay, so this is that's outcomes and incomes. This next slide gives you a picture of um, uh, the impact of gender inequality. So this is uh, the Gender Inequality Index, which captures women's disadvantage in three dimensions, empowerment, economic um, participation, and reproductive health, the indicators of which are on your right. Um, the score indicates the loss in human development due to inequality between female and male achievements in these dimensions, and can be interpreted as um, characterizing um, where a country lies in reference to a normative ideal for these indicators. So our score, which is 0.425, shows that gender inequality amounts to um, a 42.5% loss in potential human development, um, a figure that isn't quite different from the figure that was there in 1995, so at the very other end of the, of the graph. 1995 and 2000, it was at 48%. In other words, we've improved 5.5 percentage points over um, 25 years. Uh, in contrast, developing countries have moved much faster, right? So about nine percentage points. And Indonesia, one of the yellow curves on top of the black Philippine curve, um, went from 58%, a 58% loss in human development to 45% loss. So it's 13 percentage points. Now, one statistic in the GII, in this uh, Gender Inequality Index, is maternal mortality, um, which reflects the priority on the well-being of women during childbirth, and is a clear signal of women's status in, the, in society. In which case, which where you can see the Philippines, I think the failure, um, my country's failure to reduce MMR significantly over 25 years, the last 25 years is, is quite shocking. Um, in fact, if, if one looks at it, and we have reports on this, up to two-thirds of maternal deaths in the country are attributable to conditions like hemorrhage and hypertension, which are highly avoidable um, through the provision of timely and adequate OB care, um, as well as the provision of modern family planning services. And so for our country who, uh, it's one of the things that we talk about, that you know, we're aiming to be a, a, a high, it's a high middle income country. At the same time, you have this statistic staring at you in the face. And this is what um, really bothers, bothers uh, me at least, right? Because you can attribute that on the one hand to institutional fragmentation of the Department of Health or the health se sector. However, the failure to address um, those flaws in institutions could precisely be due to a gender bias um, against women. So it's this, this statistic has always been, no one really pays attention to it, but it's, it's there. So this becomes clearer in the next slide, which highlights how among all the previous MDG targets, um, efforts in improving maternal and adolescent health and, and uh, having, having uh, child malnutrition, not to mention reversing the spread of HIV and TB, fell the farthest behind in the last 25 years and have the flattest trajectories moving forward um, towards the 2030 goals. I did this, um, I did some, I was working with the UN team in the country and they're trying to uh, determine where would strategic interventions be for them. And I said, well, don't go into an arena where the country's already doing well, right? So I'll find one where there's um, some bottleneck. Okay, so if you look at these maternal mortality, you can uh, see that uh, efforts to eradicate um, 
extreme poverty and income poverty have actually done better. They've gone faster, which means that improving maternal health and adolescent health and child nutrition, again, it's not about just lifting incomes about, above the poverty line. So it indicates um, attitudes, cultural attitudes, um, most likely uh, about what is expected of women, especially mothers, and therefore influences the quality, um, the supply of, of maternal health services, as well as the demand, um, help-seeking behavior of mothers, um, uh, you know, when they need it. So coming into um, this COVID crisis, um, there was really much to do. And in fact, for this year, there was supposed to be a big push on um, stunting and nutrition, something that had not happened since the 1980s. Maternal health would also get a boost at the same time, given the importance of birth weight to child nutrition. So it wasn't central, but at least it was part of that, um, that uh, uh, effort. But um, now, of course, the future of nutrition and maternal health, um, the campaign is now up in the air, given the COVID uh, crisis and the mobility restrictions that came with it. And that in itself is a gender issue. In other words, the, the, I think the priority when the lockdown is lifted will be, you know, infrastructure, you know, big infrastructure to get things going again. And, and, and maternal and nutrition uh, concerns will, of course, be sidelined, as they, which I, ho I hope not, but they usually are. Okay, so um, this is, that in itself is a gender issue, but there are other issues that have arisen, or rather have been unveiled by the crisis as disruptions have occurred. And um, let me discuss these. I specifically, I think there, there have been three, dis, uh, three disruptions on various levels. Uh, just to, again, context, we started the lockdown on March 12 and we're still in it. So it's been, um, more, than, um, it's been more than two months. Okay, so on one level, uh, on the macro level, uh, the economy is, was forced into hibernation uh, as a necessary as a necessary step to immediately slow down the spread of the virus, as I think all countries uh, had that same motivation. Um, and crucially, it forestalled, in our case, an immediate collapse of the health system, which was already strained before COVID, and bought time to put in place, bought the uh, health system time to put in place necessary national and local health infrastructure to manage the virus moving forward. Now, whether or not the health system is ready for the economy, to start up again is really the call of public health authorities. And that's why, you know, now we have uh, the whole life versus livelihood debate that continues to rage. Second, at the meso level, where, where there was a reallocation, um, it was mentioned by um, uh, uh, the, the, the previous speaker, re, uh, sorry, uh, the first speaker, um, where there was a reallocation of all private and public resources to agencies or to activities relevant to COVID-19 response, or otherwise they suspend operations. And these were um, a, a pri you know, the reallocation to private and public health systems, to the supply chains, including production and fabrication capacities for food, health supplies, and essential goods, um, to sanitation, security, and defense at the local, uh, level and national level and to social um, safety nets. Now, uh, the gender issues that um, have arisen, of course, the first one um, is the whole, the whole issue of having to re redirect all, almost all health resources to COVID response, which has, as we all know, disrupted the delivery of vital health services to women and girls, including maternal health services, um, GBV and, and re reproductive health services. In fact, um, I, kn I knew of no ob who continued to see clients ex for the last two months, except for one good friend of mine who did so once a week under a tent in a parking lot of a government hospital on behalf of that hospital. And as a result, women had to wait near seven hours to see her. Um, Interestingly, uh, there has also been some sort of selective support for frontliners. Um, support for health personnel, 70% uh, of which are women, as, as everyone says, um, has been fully supported by both gender activists and the broad population. 
particularly the call for donations for food and protective gear. However, there's been no such call for support for individuals involved in logistics, delivering food and other supplies, peace and order officers, even sanitation engineers, who are themselves frontliners, sometimes even first responders, who not only need and, uh, or needed protective gear, but also training, um, unlike their counterparts in the health sector who have the training. Most of these individuals are men. These are gendered occupations. Finally, the use of existing social safety nets, which was the default um, to uh, uh, give cash uh, subsidies, um, to give cash subsidies. And we're talking about the CCP in this country. And uh, the use of those safety nets um, was never questioned. We, we thought, we, we, rose, we raised the question. Um, question for its differential gender impact or even its appropriateness, because the fact is a large portion of the population immediately impacted by the closing of the economy, such as transport workers, wage workers, um, were not qualified to be part of CCP. And so they're not, they would not be reached by that mechanism. And of course, a, a good a portion would be men. So there are so, a close to a thousand um, micro and small medium enterprises in, met in, in the metropolis. The third level, the third level of disruption is at the household level, the most intimate um, unit, right? Here you have, because obviously of the suspension of wage or entrepreneurial work or uh, work at home arrangements, suspension of schools, suspension of social activities. Now what has the, con the consequence of that disruption the humanitarian community warned um, us about quickly was the likelihood of an increase in domestic violence, hence the call to keep GBV services open. Now, it's, it's honest, uh, we're actually not clear whether this has taken place. We assume it. Um, there's a early, uh, there's a rapid gender assessment um, uh, that is supposed to be completed next week, but, you know, early, early uh, look at the date that indicates that it was a frequency of about 10% um, of reported uh, domestic violence. Um, but we compare that with 25% uh, that the National uh, Demographic and Health Survey typically estimated. Again, we, this may all be wrong because it's not yet done. So um, we're waiting for that. Uh, there's an e-reporting system uh, with the Commission on Human Rights, who is as, uh, assigned by law to be the ombudsman for this um, a type of uh, crime. And if you look at their website, there's about 37 reports. Now, it, it's, again, it, we may not know until you know, six months from now. Um, it's very possible, however, that the presence of our community-based networks, our watch groups, and other mechanisms um, could be working a little, uh, serving to forestall an increase in uh, GDP. This situation is, is very different from an um, evacuation center where families would not be beside uh, people they know really. Um, and so your, you know, your neighborhood watch um, would not be um, around you. Um, it's also possible that other dynamics are taking place. Um, why? Because the quarantine, um, there's a fundamental disruption going on. And what is that? That um, at the household level, uh, invisible women's work has now been made visible. So invisible house care work that women are expected to spend their time on and which we know is a key source of inequality between men and women is now visible. And by unveiling that uh, work to spouses and male children, a disruption of the status quo may take place. I don't know if it's disruption for the worse, if, whether it increases violence or, or not. But um, just so you understand, we have a system where you have a home quarantine and there's, there's one pass given to that household under the name of the household head and only whoever is using it uh, only uh, can go out to buy food and, and stuff. So it, it, it's transferable. And so um, there's ongoing, there's always a negotiation of who goes out this time and to where. Um, and so that's the, you know, that's where you have a give and take in terms of uh, between spouses and children and so forth. Um, like I said, there's a, 
rapid assessment going on, but here are just some of the anecdotes. Now, the, the people who are telling me this because I'm, I'm being brought into the loose, of course, the negative um, reports from um, LBTG and all that are far outweigh um, positive comments they've seen, but it's just interesting that this, these things are coming out. And so um, uh, a significant number of men um, uh, are, are cooking, fetching water, marketing, which they've never done before. And the remark in uh, italics is in, in Filipino, in Tagalog, and it says, um, basically, uh, gosh, my, my wife had so much work, I didn't know. Um, there's also a struggle um, you know, uh, to relinquish control among um, women uh, because they now let go of cooking or things like that. And you know, uh, there's a, there could be a distrust that whether or not their spouse can do it properly or, or something, right? So it's a, I was talking to a, a very dear friend who is actually footnoted um, and her reflection was uh, you know, really going deep into this because she was you know, experiencing the same thing. Um, uh, the anecdotes include the fact that the impact on women is not uh, homogeneous. It depends on sector, so indigenous people, urban poor, returning migrants. Barm is the Bangsamoro uh, autonomous region. And depending on that, uh, uh, decisions are made with respect to who does what. For instance, in Mindanao, apparently the women are the ones who really go out because they have, they have a, um, they're not, you know, sub, because of the militarization over there, they're not uh, subject to uh, harassment. Um, the IP women, apparently, um, they're told uh, it's safer to be home and so forth, right? Whether or not uh, a care work has increased is not very clear. It seems, it, again, it's uneven. It, um, it may be increasing for some, like solo parents or seniors, and, and not for others. Um, there, uh, the reaction to it is uh, positive and negative. There are positive points and negative points. Uh, interestingly, the negative has to do more with uh, the, the need to be dependent on a, an external RT, which is the barangay. The barangay is the village, the smallest unit. So that loss of independence. The positive has to do with um, stronger family relationship, work shared with children, and so forth. Again, this is all anecdotal. It could all change when we finally get the uh, total numbers. Now, I'm not suggesting that this disruption is a um, inflection point that would cause bias structures to fall and so forth. No, I think that when the lockdown lifts, those structures will be there waiting for all of us. But I'm also, I, I also don't think this is meant to be just an interesting um, memory. Um, I, I think that here we have a whole population to whom the invisible work of women, of their wives, mothers, became visible for now more than two months. And most of them have likely shared and participated in that work. Participated in that work, and I really want to know what that means in terms of um, elevating um, the discourse. Um, you know, we in, in the school have said in a faculty paper that the crisis laid bare serious weaknesses in economic systems, and if equity, resilience, and sustainable development are to remain at the core of the country's vision for itself, then Observations of how these systems performed, our health system, our food security, and so forth, have to be taken into account in the design of economic policy moving forward. And to ignore these um, observations and assume that we can simply go back to, um, to uh, simply start where we left off would be a real waste, you know, to squander, uh, would, we'd be squandering a unique opportunity to possibly reset the, the country on a better development path. And I think the same thing applies to uh, the work for gender parity, at least in, in my country. You know, um, working to improve economic resilience will be important work. We know that this work will disproportionately improve uh, women's well being and improve gender equality. At the same time, however, the disruption in household relations this crisis has imposed on um, many of us, I think, goes to the heart of gender stereotyping, at least the way I understand it, um, the source of gender inequality, and could provide insights into what uh, sort of policies um, uh, uh, can help really moving forward. And so I hope that uh, you know, these questions on the right, you know, is, is there a way to 
extend this experience uh, to the market or at least in a reflective manner somehow um, mine it for something that is useful. So I hope this thing, um, these questions can be part of um, a research agenda moving forward, at least in, in my country. Thank you very much. Thank you, Toby. Um, uh, we are running uh, actually a bit late, uh, so I will pass to Mahin Sultan now from BIGD. Thank you very much. Um, I'm very glad to be a discussant at this webinar, which BIGD is co-hosting with CDES. I won't um, comment on everything because I think both three presentations were very rich. I'd just like to pick up on a few points. Um, I think all three have shown that um, what we know that crises and pandemics such as these exacerbate vulnerabilities and inequalities, including gender inequalities. And um, it's very interesting that, you know, Alka first uh, took up the issue of uh, sexual and reproductive health and rights. There where women have specific needs, women and girls, we can also see the very specific kinds of impacts that there are. Um, and I found very interesting the way she um, divided the impacts between direct, direct and unintentional and indirect and intentional because I think we have to be very aware also of the political dimensions of what is happening in different parts of the world in using the pandemic to maybe bring forward certain agendas of restriction and uh, constriction of rights. And I thought that was a very important uh, thing that she highlighted. And another point with which both Alka and Toby brought out, that we have to be aware of the differences between women. Um, that not all women are being impacted the same way. And in fact, that it might also be uh, increasing inequalities between women. And that is something we need to be aware of. Um, then uh, moving to Sajida's uh, presentation, I really like this concept of infodemic, which maybe is uh, well known, but I heard it today. And I think this is a very interesting thing that uh, which has changed. I mean, we have seen even in Bangladesh, in my in our experience, that this exposure to information, both uh, correct and incorrect, and all sorts of information, is really having a very interesting impact. And this access to mobile phones, to the internet, and uh, also from the community. And uh, all three speakers, especially the first two, brought out the. Uh, changing situation, things are evolving on a day-to-day -day basis, and which is why there is um, a need to collect information and do research also on the evolving situation of the COVID. And under BIGD, we also have a rapid research response program where we also are thinking that it's important to go back uh, at a regular period to know how things are evolving. Um, I think um, Sajid also brought out this risk of school dropouts and early marriages, and these are things that we will need to monitor. Uh, another thing uh, we have also found in our qualitative work in, with adolescents in slums, this uh, fatalism and the dependence on religion, sort of, it seems that in times of crisis, there might be one of the responses is to turn to religion and uh, trying to explain things by this is God's will and I will get sick if it's God's will. Um, another important thing I think that uh, these presentations highlighted for me is that the impact, gender impact or whatever impact we will talk about of COVID will depend on the existing situation uh, in the different countries, the economic context, the political context, what were the trends and there is a risk that um, unless we make a deliberate effort, uh, the COVID will just exacerbate or continue with the existing trends of inequality. Um, uh, so that is something we need to think about. Uh, in terms of um, domestic violence, I'd just like to comment on that. As Toby said, it's assumed that there will be an increase in domestic violence. And in Sajida's presentation, the adolescents were uh, putting their perceptions um, 
from our side in BIGD, we're having difficulties in really finding data in the South Asian context, Bangladesh context, to show whether it's really increasing, decreasing, is it a lack of reporting? Is it, is it that because the, they're more in the community, they're getting more community support? Or because they're in their families, they're not being able to report? But what we know is that the government agencies or NGO agencies are not being able to respond to whatever cases there are. So that is a cause for concern. Um, and finally, I'd like to reflect on the some uh, positives that uh, some of the present two of the presentations picked up. One, as Toby said, that with care work, domestic work, what is in was invisible is now being more visible because men are participating more, talking about it. And as Alka said, that it's a good time to rethink uh, or push back the negative uh, developments that have taken place in our countries and try and win back some reproductive freedoms uh, using the space or maybe the opportunity to question those. I think I'll end there. Thank you. Thank you, Mahin. Uh, I think we are a bit, a lot behind the schedule. We will go directly to the question and answers and our presenters um, uh, can reflect on their presentations or ans and answer the questions. So uh, with this, um, I'll just post some questions and stop and then ask you to respond. So the first question is um, uh, related to what uh, Shajeda presented uh, is on, uh, so about the personal issues, um, asking questions related to personal issues uh, uh, over phone, and that might surely harm um, or worsen the situation within the family. A related question is, uh, there are also lower degree of access to mobile phones by these adolescents, uh, and it probably depends on the family or social norms. Um, whether your survey can answer any of these issues, I'll just ask this. Shadida. Um, yeah, indeed. Of course, the uh, we had these long discussions when we were asking the questions, particularly on uh, experience of violence or witnessing violence. Um, and we, um, so we went back and forth on it. Uh, one strategy we took was to make the questions um, in a way that they, it could be yes, no answers, um, uh, assuming that, you know, they were not on speakerphone. The other was the survey, the interview tried to do what we do in a face-to-face -face setting, which is to say, can we have a private space? A third was that uh, we tried to um, secure some level of privacy by making an appointment on the phone and, the, and, and actually taking consent about the timing of the interview. So I think we try to replicate on the phone the usual steps that we would take for in-person interviews in order to ensure that we weren't putting the respondents at any kind of increased risk. But yes, that was a, a, a big consideration. And we, for instance, uh, that was one of the reasons why we didn't ask questions on access to contraception uh, and services like that for uh, for privacy reasons. Um, access to phone, um, again, so I think this varies by context and it's very specific uh, for uh, different contexts. So to give you a sense, we know from the enlistment that we did a month before for another survey, which was in person, um, that 90% was able, able to give a phone number that we could reach out to uh, of the, a representative sample of our adolescents. 98% said that the household own a mobile phone and only about a fourth of that were uh, personal uh, phones for the girls. But I think this process of 
seeking permission, actually getting them to respond by SMS that they were consenting to give in was <clears throat> meant to ensure that this phone would be secured. And for younger adolescents, we did what we do with younger adolescents in person. <clears throat> we sought her assent and we sought permission from the guardian before we proceeded with the interview. This brings a related question that how representative of your sample is in terms of the Bangladesh context. Uh, so we are not saying that it's, uh, I started out saying that these were both done in the context of programs. About half of the adolescent sample was actually representative of adolescents living in the areas where the programs were being implemented. So about 500 of them. Um, so that part is representative. The other half are representative of girls who were in the program. So these are usually in and out of school girls who were accessing the program. And the Amra Manush sample was representative of service users for Amra Manush. So <clears throat> I think you know, the, these are not generalizable to beyond these populations, but we have a fair idea because we're working in these populations and we've been doing baseline, midline, end line. These are actually not the Amra, Amra Manush, the population council studies are actually part of a uh, randomized control trials uh, where we have quite a lot of information about the populations that we are uh, talking about. That's why we know what the phone ownership is, what the educational background is. We have a lot of detailed information on time use patterns, contraceptive use, et cetera, of the population, not in that particular survey. So uh, that kind of is our motivation for doing the rapid surveys in those populations because we can, it, it allows the possibility to build, for instance, even interventions and see how they work out. Okay, so the next question is to Alka. Um, it's related to the um, COVID-19 effects on total fertility rates. It, do you think it, has, it will have positive or negative effect? And if the effect is negative, will that not lead to increased sun preference? Okay. Yeah, uh, I don't know, but if these estimates by various groups are correct, it's likely that uh, in the short term, at least there'll be a rise in birth rates. Now, and, they, and as I said, it, it also probably is likely that there will be a rise in uh, the sex ratio. By rise, I mean that it will be less masculine. Uh, it can work either way. It's too short term, but a lot depends on how, what time frame we use. If you're thinking in terms of just a few months, it's very difficult to know what will happen because there's still time for people who want, are determined to have a son to have an abortion. If you're thinking of, of the long term, if you're thinking of what will happen by next year, uh, it's very likely that birth rates will rise, the birth rate this year will be higher. Whether that's going to mean that more daughters and therefore an even, uh, making up next year or an ability to live with the idea that there's nothing or that maybe daughters aren't such a bad thing. I don't know. I think it's very similar to what was said uh, by Toby about domestic violence. Maybe people will discover that uh, 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 gender equality is not such a bad thing. So just like you discover the sharing of household tasks is not such a bad thing that maybe husbands discover that women uh, are doing much more than they realized they were doing. Maybe this uh, rise in the masculinity ratio will not lead to uh, 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 lead to action to stop boys being born, and the rise in the fertility. I think if they don't have access to contraception. The negative part is that is going to be a rise in fertility occasioned by a rise in unintentional births. So what that is going to mean, I don't know. Again. This is all such open territory because there's some literature that is saying that maybe uh, it's not clear what is happening to sexual activity. Is it rising or is it falling as, as a result of the COVID? Are people scared of even getting infected from their partners or are they in fact using their free time to have more sex? We don't know. So depending on what is happening, we might get actually a fall in fertility because everyone's terrified. But if we do have active uh, sexuality without access to contraception, 
we'll get a rise in fertility. But uh, I, this is all, these are all idle speculations and I'm waiting for December and some, uh, some birth and death registration data uh, to be made available rapidly to be able to talk, think about it. Yeah, I think uh, another issue could be related to the stress and anxiety that their partners are feeling, and that could be also related to the um, sexual behavior and uh, reproduction as well. So the uh, next question is um, to Alka and Toby. In terms of you have addressed many issues in uh, what needs to be done and in uh, on, on the gender context. Given the, this is a pandemic situation, if the government needs to address pressing issues, what would be the first three set of policy issues in, in, the, in this area in terms of sexual and reproductive health uh, that the government should address now? Uh, if I can just uh, say very briefly, I think I, what I was doing in that last slide was talking about what the government should do right away in, the, in terms of practical issues and that what it should do in terms of thinking of the big picture. So in terms of practical issues, I really think this idea of uh, uh, service, health service being essential should be made to overlap with the idea of the health service being available. So we need much better ways, very practical things. How are pregnant women expected to reach a hospital in time for a delivery? How is the hospital system going to be geared to uh, providing uh, safe uh, non-virus -expo non exposure conditions for a delivery. How is contraception going to, I do think that they need to think harder about contraceptive access, maybe just making more things uh, available over the counter, more easily available, uh, reduce making uh, uh, pharmacies uh, uh, not demand prescriptions for everything. These are all very practical things, but I think the main thing is that it has to be um, uh, availability and accessibility of services. That's the very short term thing I would think about, uh, including abortion. Abortion is the, of course, the uh, skeleton in the cupboard that no one knows how to address. And I think that that's the very immediate short term. And uh, well, I should probably mention in the short term also, I'm keeping my fingers crossed that that private members build on population control doesn't get passed. So for India, at least, uh, these are the three things that I would talk about that accessibility through informal means, if necessary, like contraception, not waiting for a prescription, uh, accessibility uh, and then uh, accessibility and availability overlapping with one another, especially for delivery services. These are all the non-contested things. These are all to do with sexual and reproductive health. I'm not even talking about rights, but for the moment, I think the focus has to be in the immediate short term on health with this caution about what is going to, what is being done to rights in the background. So we can draw your attention and can I also add uh, that um, in terms of your, your observations or anecdote, uh, the positives, uh, can we think about something positive before we finish this? Who are you asking? Uh, to Toby. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't catch that. Sorry. So the, my question to you is uh, in terms of the policy, um, what policies you think in the area of gender equality uh, in this kind of pandemic, the government needs to address urgently? And the second is your observations or anecdotes, uh, one related to the, uh, apart from the ne all the negative issues that are happening within the houses because of this stress, anxiety, and intra-household violence. Uh, and the, you mentioned there are some positive aspects also happening. Uh, in this context, how, what, what lessons, what positive lessons can we also learn uh, that the, the pandemic actually brings uh, to the family? Um, well, I think I, I, I think the, uh, I, um, the policies were very said. I agree with um, Alaka on, on those. I would just add that I, I hope that they don't. There's not an extreme movement to uh, tertiary curative care. 
because we badly need um, you know, primary health services, especially maternal health services. And that's what I'm worried about. I actually think, you know, if you look at on Facebook, um, and I, you know, you, you'll see many groups of, for instance, in our country, of uh, men who are now talking to each other about how difficult it is to uh, go to the grocery and, and market. And, you know, they really have a hard time. So, you know, if you, and if you go to the market yourself, you'll see many uh, men who happen, if, if they're turned on their phones, you know, taking in directions as to what type of food or what type. And um, right now the spirit, I'm not, I hope I'm not being facetious, but you know, in, in this rapid gender assessment that they're doing, and I'm encouraging them to do it another time, you know, do it another round. I really want to know what, um, you know, what parts of it did men and women enjoy? Right in terms of discovering this thing, um, in terms of household co-sharing, household work, and I think that at least in our country, um, uh, this is something that can be uh, capitalized on because we have a tendency to to like those stories and and to follow when something is um, you know when something has a good uh, you know a good outcome such as that. And um, it's just very interesting to learn how men are learning, let me put it that way, so um, about how scare work. And, and I, I just know that there's something there that we can uh, use going forward for gender parity. That's all I know. I don't know what, I don't know how. I hope government allows research on this, and I hope people do it too. I'll go back to Sadeda. Uh, she probably wants to add something. Uh, yeah, I wish I could uh, share this um, kind of um, optimism about uh, gender equality. I think there is a little bit of magical thinking in thinking that somehow, you know, millennia of gendered behavior is going to get overturned uh, during a time when there is increased stress, increased stigma, and increased scarcity. I just think that that's not how humans respond to adversity. Um, I'd love to be proved wrong. Um, and I think uh, in a, you know, some of us who have the luxury of working from home or spending lots of quality time with our kids uh, may uh, see some of that, but I think that's because we don't have the stress of loss of income and not knowing where the food's going to come from. And that's a very good observation. We are running our surveys in Bangladesh and we are actually uh, using this PSS score to try to understand uh, the mental health of the women. And we find that people who are more food insecure are more likely to be mentally depressed and other issues. Uh, we haven't yet explored the gender dimension, but we have the data and we will be able to find out. I have to say, I'm sorry, I wasn't suggesting that it was it would magically solve itself. I'm just saying that I think it's worth looking at in terms of whether or not it can inform us how to deal with uh, the challenge, which has been our challenge all this time, in terms of redistributing time, right? And I, you know, we, we always hit that wall. And I just, I'm just wondering if even if the negative outweighs the positive in this experience, that we can still learn something from those who, um, you know, who manage to uh, who manage to have some sort of transformation. I'm not suggesting that it's going to be total at all. Yeah, I, I, I have seen the number of newspaper reports uh, in when the pandemic. Uh, I mean started from China that men are cooking a lot more than women <laughs> during this pandemic. So let's hope that it continues and um, let's hope we uh, get something positive out of it. And uh, hopefully this uh, uh, pandemic bring us some good lessons and in terms of the gender equality, women empowerment, education of the girls, uh, their reproductive health, uh, we hope that government and policymakers also think carefully uh, to address these issues, both during this pandemic and utilize this time 
to address the longer term uh, problems that we have been uh, actually experiencing. Um, thank you all. Uh, um, uh, let's give thanks to our presenters and the discussion. Uh, on behalf of BIGD and CDAS, um, we thank you all for participating. Uh, we hope you all stay well and safe. Thank you. 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 It was a great. Congratulations. I, I like your, uh, Mahim, I I, your comments were really good. Thank you for that. No, I enjoyed all the presentation. Summary. <laughs> wow, how did you do that? <laughs>